The Craig Folly Show on Deadline Detroit is made possible in part by Lynette's Shrimp House, located in Highland Park. It's Metro Detroit's premier destination, serving juicy fried shrimp, fish, and wings, alongside soul food sides and new additions to the menu, like turkey tacos and desserts. Located at 13548 Woodward in Highland Park, just north of the Davidson, Lynette's is open for takeaway, noon to 8, Tuesday and Thursday, noon to 10 p.m. Friday and Saturday, and noon to 5 p.m. on Sunday. Call now, get some Lynette's. Happy Friday, as Craig always says, and welcome to the week that was the Craig Folly Show this week without Craig Folly. <laughs> I am your co hostess. I'm Nancy Derringer from Deadline Detroit. And uh, our my counterpart over here is my boss, editor, and of course, mentor, late life mentor, um, <laughs> Alan Lingle, co founder, co founder and editor of Deadline Detroit. And I hope we have a good show for you today because as usual in this crazy world, it has been a crazy week and there's lots to talk about. This is, of course, the edition of the show where we uh, hatch over the week that was and just tell ourselves, thank God that's over, almost over. Um, With me today, besides Alan, is uh, some veterans of this show that some of you who are regulars might know. Um, First, we have Saeed Khan, who is a lecturer or are you an assistant prof um i think senior lecturer but according to the collective bargaining agreement that might change to uh, <laughs> professor status oh okay good <laughs> so a senior lecturer in middle east uh affairs at wayne state university there is uh down in the uh, bottom right of the screen portia roberson ceo of focus hope and um <laughs> we're still trying to get adolf mongo here. i'm on here he is i see you your hands hey, adolf face. He's a political consultant. I had to use my phone. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's fine. A political consultant for a um, long time, denizen of Detroit, knows everything and uh, knows where all the bodies are buried. And so, radio host at 9, 10 a.m. from yes. 10, to, 10 to noon on Saturdays. That's right. And who's a regular guest on that show, Alan? Yeah. Okay. So it's you. <laughs> Adolf and I, I've known Adolf since seventh grade. Okay. Well, then you go back. I have to say, though, I, I just have to say one thing. Um, I was at the Hamtramck Labor Day Fest, and a guy walked up to me and said, are you Nancy Kaffer from Deadline Detroit? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I'm Nancy Derringer from Deadline Detroit. Why do you ask? And he said, I watch the show every week on Facebook. I'm like, yay! So we actually have, a, we have an audience. So anyway, uh, let's get started. It has been a crazy week, and I think probably the event that uh, started on uh, Tuesday, I believe it was, is the thing we want to start with. So Michael, take it away. I said no justice, no peace. James James Craig is for the police. James Craig is for the hate. We won't let him win our state. A few moments later. Now this is what contingency planning looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I I shouldn't laugh at that. I mean, because in my heart, I believe that people should be uh, should be respectful when others are speaking. But at the same time, knowing a little bit about how politics and advance work goes, I have to say that was either the biggest screw up since. I don't know the uh, since JD Vance's sign fell off of his podium, um, or potentially 3D chess. And for this, I think we need to start with Adolf because Adolf knows Detroit politics like nobody else. They what better happened? hire Adolf. They better hire Adolf very quickly. <laughs> they can't, can't hire him. me. <laughs> they can't, he can't hire me. Listen, he's an idiot. Now, whoever planned that. Listen, you know, when you plan something like that and and you got people that's going to come and protest, you can't have it out in the open in a place like Belle Isle. He, he forgot he's not the police chief surrounded by 10 cops, et cetera. He brought his would uh, want to be proud boy staff with him. Uh, they he need to fire all of them. But you know what? He probably planned it himself. He is not ready for prime time. The guy is not ready. Uh, He's going to get trounced. He might not. You know, I thought he might be the favorite 
in the Republican primary. But if this is the way the game is played uh, from his end, he's going to have a problem winning the, uh, the nomination unless, you know, uh, somebody's going to have to take over that campaign and they're going to have to turn him in to a candidate. First thing he should have done was uh, go rent a church. Go, he could have went to any church. They would have let him come up there and, and, and a whole press conference. He had some uh, relationships with a lot of ministers. He could have got his own people there. He could have had a couple hundred people, 300 people. They standing with him. And then he then he can talk uh, the smack. But then to say these people were paid, had no evidence, they got him. He's not Trump where Trump just tell a lie uh, every <laughs> five words. And now uh, he's trying to tell lies and they're throwing it back in the face. The reporter from WDET said, you got any uh, proof? No, but I have a feeling. <laughs> you know what? So, yeah, Craig is, listen, Craig is, 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 is like a little kid uh, playing with grown people. That's, that, that's what I saw. Okay. That, I, I, I I Nancy, they told him that they were going to protest. That's the thing that's so remarkable to me. They pivoted after they protested, but they told him on Facebook that they were going to be on Belle Isle to protest. And nobody in the campaign said, ooh, we might need to figure out a new place to go. We might not need to do it on Bella. They were like, oh, we're going to go there anyways. And then you got what you got. Well, but you know what? Can I interject for a minute? Yes, when sir. Jeff Feiger was running for governor in 1998, that's what we did with Feiger. We went to Larry Orn was one of the candidates. He had a, a party out at Bell Isle. We went out there and turned it out. And, and when we left, people was hollering Figa time. That's what you, when you, you open yourself for stuff like that. And, 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 and listen, if you got some smart candidates running against them, that's what you do. He has thin skin. He can dish it out, but he can't take it. Well, that raises a question, though. And, you know, maybe one of you guys want to address this. Anybody can address this one. Is it possible? Because this is the, 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 day or the later that afternoon take that was coming off of Twitter and, you know, uh, various political sites, which was that it was all, they knew this was going to happen. And the whole idea was to get a bunch of B-roll video of him being shouted down so that they could take it onto Tucker Carlson that night and say, look what the left wants to do to Michigan. Um, I should probably say, I don't think at the beginning of the hour, I even uh, said that for, for the people who are listening and maybe don't know, that was of course the, um, first appearance of Republican gubernatorial, 2022 gubernatorial candidate, James Craig, former police chief of Detroit. Does anybody else want to uh, speculate on that? Saeed, anybody? I, 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 I think you're spot on. I mean, I, we, we have to be cynical enough to realize that this is all game tape that they can uh, use elsewhere. And especially on a national level, uh, which of course uh, means that Detroit becomes the brunt of a joke the same way Jay Leno used to joke about us, uh, which isn't helpful. Um, but I will say one thing. I mean, the only thing that would have been better than the air horn would have been more cowbell. Uh, <laughs> I have that there. But but I, th I think that this is unfortunately, um, and especially I think within the age of social media, going to be an increased uh, gamble that people take. Is it worth uh, having the extra exposure? But if you can't control it, uh, it doesn't make him look any more competent. Yeah. And, 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 there's yeah, no question. Yeah. There's no really? there's no question that he looked weak. And 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 we did that before there was social media, before there was the internet of Facebook and Instagram, because it made Larry Orn look weak. Everywhere he showed up, we were there and we shouted him down. This is that's what we did. And you know. Uh, and that's what they're going to do to Chief Craig. Chief Craig unlied. He's the black, white hope in this race. He untold these Republicans that he controlled these black folks in, 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 in Detroit doing uh, the Black Lives Matter protest that uh, he know for a fact that they met. The Black Lives Matter people met with other folks around the country and they planned all this out. The guy is delusional. And, and so if he wants to show that, he's going to show some tape of a weak um, uh, uh, candidate who he I, he don't even he's not even prepped for the answers. He, he has no agenda. He got, what is his agenda? 
Well, I think we can Charlie, a second. Go ahead, Alan. Char, uh, one minute. Charlie Ladoff had a great line in his column this week about uh, about the chief, where he said, "Now the chief has learned that uh, you can't always find a cop when you need one," uh, <laughs> and which I thought was great. But also, I mean, here's a guy who's in the Republican Party, which is just a, it's not a great fit, and and he's trying to play on his Detroit police chief thing. He makes the announcement in Detroit. Well, sorry, if you're trying to play on that, your strengths there, your strength, you can't be a Trump Republican. You can't go around saying the the election was a fraud, which he's afraid to say anything about because he doesn't want to offend the Republicans. But he also has to, you know, be concerned about his constituents, which he's trying to get more votes than any Republican has gotten in Detroit, which he may not, you know, that may not happen the way he's playing his cards. You know, it's it's interesting that you're right. And I, I think one of the things that is kind of weird about this campaign is everybody has known that he's running because it leaked as soon as he turned in his retirement papers back in like May. Right. So and, every, and it was he's going to run for governor. And then it was, well, now he's going to come out and he's going to give a speech, uh, but a political speech. He's not going to say he's just going to say we need to get rid of Gret Gretchen Whitmer and lay out his um his, his uh, resume for the hardcore that turned up in Jackson that day to watch him. And then it was, uh, then he goes on Tucker and he says, I'm running and all this stuff. So it's like, everybody knows this was coming. And so then when it finally, but then, then he gives an interview to Nolan Finley and he says something like, well, before I announce, I have to get my, my, you know, I got to get my platform down. I got to get my, my shit tight essentially. And it's like, you're 60 five years old and you don't know how you feel about abortion you don't know i mean you're a, a grown man and you really honestly have to have to think about whether the election was stolen i mean it's it's silly and, and you then, want to be governor like you don't want to be a state rep you don't want to start small you want to be governor of the state but this right. is how you like launch your campaign sure. and you have no platform and you were supposed to take some time to get that together you didn't no. And your campaign should have prepped you for, like Adolf said, for answers to the questions that are inevitably going to come. And it doesn't seem like they've prepped him yet. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I think yeah, there's some but, strong Republican candidates that are going to challenge this sort of um, sort of decision that the Republican Party may have made that James Craig is their person. And this is not helping them to sort of shy away from getting in the race themselves. So right. the, the primary is really not going to be as easy as I think he originally thought it was going to be a black Republican that was a former police chief. I think he thought he had a wash on Detroit and that would be enough to get him to win the state or win the uh, ticket. Um, you think, you know I don't what, think Nancy, that's going to happen. You know what, Nancy, you say 65. I think he had to think about when you asked him, is he, uh, he's anti-abortion. The question from his campaign should have been, you ever had a girlfriend, you're 65 years old, they got an abortion. You got to yeah. ask those questions before you jump out as a candidate. And those are those are legitimate questions because when you say you're against this or you for this, you know, and at you 65, you, you at, at 22, you might have thought a different way than you did at 42. Now you're 65 uh, years old. So I think Craig is caught in the middle of a, should I say I'm against this? Should I say I'm for this? You know, it, it, listen, the he guy- got more than he bargained for, essentially. Right, and the guy <laughs> uh, uh, tried to come on Whitmer saying, I, fix the damn roads. Now, what is your game plan for <laughs> fixing the roads and the infrastructure uh, bill that's in, nice, in Washington right? that's gonna bring all this money to, uh, to Detroit or Michigan and the Republicans are blocking it? Right. Well, I, think, I think we also need to look at the Republican Party in the state and the kind of candidates they, that they want to run and try to exploit identity politics. I mean, we saw this with John James as well. And, and now we've got uh, uh, we got uh, James Craig. I think they got something for the name James. And, uh, there's, they're, they're, I mean, clearly, um, clearly Chief Craig is out of his depth, but this is what being a Manchurian candidate is about. <laughs> Except I really hope that his campaign manager has a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a back line to Beijing and saying, listen, um, if Craig decides to go ahead and attack, I'll, I'll stop him. <laughs> I have to say one thing, though, Nancy, I, I, I am impressed with the idea. And I say this to you as a woman, like 
men who can jump in races or things that I can't see in, in any way, shape or form they're ready for. I mean, what does Chief Craig know about infrastructure? What does he know about transportation? What does he know about education? What does he know about balancing a budget of the size of the state of Michigan? Um, you know, what, I mean, all of the these things, and yet he's ready. He's ready. Yeah. He leads from the front. I the don't even know what that time, means. <laughs> the last time I was on the job market, a very wise friend of mine told me, you know, Nance, he, she said, he said, I counsel a lot of women, you know, mostly younger than you, but you know, who are doing in the same position as you are. And I always tell them if a job posting goes up with 10, um, you know, qualifications before, you know, you have to do all this before you apply. Women will not apply unless Absolutely. they have at least that's exactly nine of what I'm them. Saying. They said yep. men will apply if they have two. So, <laughs> right. you know, I think that's, I mean, we elected a reality show host to the president, presidency of the United States. So there's all kinds of people out there. And we think, elected a peanut farmer as the president of the United States. <laughs> he was a governor, don't forget though. that. But he was, he was governor, a governor of Georgia. Georgia. I mean, Anybody was... can be governor of Georgia. Look at Lester Maddox. He was running a restaurant <laughs> and his claim to fame was uh, chasing black people out uh, uh, his place with an axe. With so, an axe yeah. My mother, my mother had a great line when Sarah Palin was running. She said, "You know what? She thinks she's such a big shot, but you know what? In Alaska, even I could be a big shot." <laughs> 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 All right. Well, now that we've uh, filleted uh, uh, GOP, <laughs> GOP frontrunner uh, James Craig, let's uh, stay in the political realm for a minute and talk a little bit about. Um, the other news that came out on the Detroit uh, election front, which was that Mike Duggan has said that he will not debate Anthony Adams and he doesn't want to hear about it, which means perhaps our, my co-host, Mr. Lengel, would like to uh, make the point that he makes in his column today in Deadline Detroit. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's horrible. We don't. This has been such a lame race. We don't know what the issues, I mean, we know as, as Detroiters what, what the issues are for us, but we don't know that they're on their radar. It's like Chief Craig when he says, someone asks him about the roads, and he goes, well, that's not a high priority for me. It's like, we want to know what the priorities are for the next administration, whether it, we're assuming it's going to be dug in. I mean, Anthony Adams doesn't seem to be getting much traction there, but the idea that here is Duggan, Duggan is making a calculated move and thinking, why should I do this? I'm, I'm ahead, what do I have to gain by doing this? But he, he looks, he comes off as weak. It looks like he's afraid that, you know, he, Duggan's the world champion and he's afraid this, this lightweight is gonna land a punch in there. But, you know, it, 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 it's just, I, I think it's bad for us because we don't know what the issues are. There should be campaign promises. There should be agenda set for the next uh, term, and we're not getting that, and he and Duggan is undermining that. Well, I think uh, Anthony Adams, his campaign, it, it has not uh, been the kind of campaign that 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 um brought up these issues. Four years ago, people laughed at Coleman Young the second, but Coleman Young the second brought up the issues, took it to Duggan, and and made them debate. I don't see this. Well, this you know this. about that campaign. Yes, Tell us how I you, do. How you, how I you do. Did that? How did you? But know? but Anthony Adams, they he should be having uh, commercials, et cetera. I know you got to have the money, but when you start a campaign six months out, you you behind the eight ball right then and there. If you're gonna if you're gonna take somebody out of that seat, you got to start a year or two, putting your organization together getting uh, commitments from people who have money. And, 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 and when you announce, you're ready to roll. Now he's feeling bad. If I was uh, Duggan, I wouldn't debate him either. Why should I debate it? I, listen, he... Well, that's on a purely political calculation, though. Yes. But from, from the voter standpoint, I think we're getting short shrifted here. You know, a short trip here. But uh, I don't know. I mean, calculated, yeah. But I think Duggan, I think Duggan looks weak by by doing that. It's not going to matter. He's going to trounce him. I mean, if it's eighty, it's probably going to be like eight, he'll probably win by eighty percent at least. He's he's secretariat rounding the um, last third. <laughs> why why, why is Anthony in the in the race when you don't run a real race? But, now you know people get mad, but when when you ask. Why did you, when are you starting your campaigning? And that's over a year ago. Uh, it's too early. It's too early. 
Well, you know, it's too late now. It's you not know, too that, early if you're trying to take out an incumbent. You and I both no have had question. this discussion, Adolph, and so you know I know right. that like you got to start two years. You want to take out the incumbent um, who basically led during a pandemic. I, you know, I I know that people think that they can wait to the last minute, but you can't. You can't raise enough money. You can't get your message out. It was going to be a tough year to campaign, anyways, because people were not going to be able to do retail politics the way they used to do it. And so you had to get your message out early. I, I totally understand why Duggan's not doing it. He led what he want. He went through the primary with 71 percent of the vote. But I do think there's an argument to be made for democracy and the ability for to see your candidates out there debating one another. Um, right. You know, I mean, if I just think it's debate. part of what we we want people to be involved in. We are begging people to vote all the time. If they can't see the candidates that are out there for them to make choices about, we can't hear what their messages are, then. Are, is it a futile effort to ask them to then go make a decision in a voting booth that they don't have any information about? But that, but but Adams' campaign should have been a. a he was the deputy mayor. He he ran he the water department. He knows politics. It's not like he's a neophyte. He knows what it would take uh, to take out an incumbent, and his campaign has failed at that. And now. Uh, it, you know what? He's crying over spilt milk. Oh, he won't debate me. Well, that's the way it, that incumbents is in the catbird seat. Mm -hmm. Doug is in the catbird seat. Whatever you say, uh, that the, the Detroiters are missing out, maybe. But they, whose fault is that? Yeah, that's. Well, let me ask you, Adolph, how tough is it for a guy like Anthony Adams to get people to give him money? He, 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 he doesn't clear. look the park. He look like a a, 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 a a Wall Street attorney walking into a room. Uh, you know, it, 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 that people are not comfortable. You're talking about community people. They He can go in there and get down in the trenches. Hey, listen, hey, he's a smart guy. You know, he's been around a long time, but his, his, his campaign organization is something to be desired. And he just, what have you heard during this, what, two, three months of campaigning? Has he really brought, put some issues on the table that made uh, the mayor respond to it, that would have to respond to it? And listen, they, they, they laughed at Coleman Young four years ago. But one thing, Coleman Young threw some issues out there and, and the mayor had to respond and had to spend money and even though we knew what was going to happen in the end, but uh, you you got to give some kind of a fight. This is like that uh, what Evander Holyfield uh, fiasco, you know? <laughs> should the guy not knock him out because he's he's fifty nine years old? No, you get in the ring with somebody, you play to win, and this is what the Duggan uh, campaign is doing. They plan to win, taking no prisoners. We're not even debating you. You're not even worth debating. That's what. That's the message that they sent out there. What have you? What What have you uh, put on the table that's going to make me respond to a uh, debate? Right. So he's he, essentially he's he's decided he's secretariat and he doesn't even need to look over his shoulder. So no, he's he's running. He's running a, a hundred yard dash with his sweats on. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and see, I'm not I'm not like the biggest equestrian follower, but I've never seen a horse look back. <laughs> no, the horse doesn't. The jockey does. So okay. he's, driving, oh. he's driving the car. So, <laughs> so I'll, 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 let me rephrase it. He's secretariat and Ron Turcotte is not looking good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, let's do one more political topic until we, uh, before we move on to uh, world affairs. Um, the other big news of the week politically was the California recall, which turned out to be an absolute blowout. Like Why did we bother to send a quarter, spend a quarter billion dollars on this farce? And, you know, I was until the end, I was reading that, oh, polls show that it could be surprisingly close, you know, to, yeah, or uh, what's his face? Newsom shouldn't shouldn't be too comfortable. And yet it was a it was a blowout. It was two two thirds voted against the recall. I think uh, Larry Elder got, you know, what, 24 percent of the Republican vote over there. The rest of them were scattered one and two percent among a whole squad of 
dummies, including Caitlyn Jenner. Um, <laughs> is there any message? Do you think there's any message for the Democrats as we go into the next big political cycle? I mean, are we freaking I, out over I nothing? Think, I, I, I think, think the message. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think the message to the Democratic Party is we should be afraid of recalls if the Republicans put up a credible, sane candidate. But if you put up, you know, Larry Elder and Caitlyn Jenner and a whole bunch of other people, some guy who rented a bear to campaign with him because it was a Beauty and the Beast kind of thing, like then you will have a recall that turns out the way the recall turned out in California. But that's not to say that if they had put up a credible candidate who didn't sound absolutely ridiculous, they might have had a shot at a recall of Newsom. I mean, it's happened before in California, so it's not a, you know, it wasn't a given that he was going to pull out of this, but I think the candidates that looked like they would win if the recall succeeded were just too far crazy for anybody to get behind. I, I think I think it's a, a cautionary tale, even for, here in Michigan. I think the idea is perceptions matter. The guy went out to a restaurant and that became such a, a focus point a uh, focal point of, of, of all that. And we're seeing, you know, Whitmer has had some, you know, bad optics and she's should be forewarned that, uh, you know, you don't get no free passes, particularly yeah. in this kind of environment where you have an aggressive Republican party that's going to look for any opening to try to, you know, dethrone you. So, well, she flew on that plane, that, yeah. uh, uh, you know, that jet to Florida. Yeah. When she was telling people not to go, and, yeah. and she found out the hard way that you can't say uh, "do as I say" and not "what as I do." Yeah, but she also was not very forthright about after it all started coming out who flew the plane, who paid for the plane, uh, that her, it ended up that her two daughters flew back on the way back. It was just a whole mess. And then then she shows up in East Lansing where she her own health department had an order saying no more than six people uh, at a table or something at a, at a restaurant. Here she's with 10 people posing and smiling. Uh, those optics matter. And we saw that in California. And so she better, uh, you know, pay attention. Well, you didn't, say explain, didn't she explain yeah. Yeah, that four of those people were holograms, uh, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> getting, getting ready for the ABBA reunion? <laughs> no, I, I mean, Nancy, you asked the question about do Democrats need to be concerned? Uh, Two thirds may have voted against the recall, but that doesn't mean that Democrats are uh, have unanimity about Newsom. Uh, I think that the progressives might have gone into the polling booth and held their noses saying, well, we don't want a Republican in there. We don't want a recall. But from what it sounds like, uh, there's no lock on uh, on a Democratic candidate uh, in uh, the next uh, election cycle there. And I think that's something that we have to consider both in the midterms and in uh, 2024 about whether the internal dynamics of uh, democratic politics are going to uh, cannibalize and then uh, open the door for a pretty weak Republican candidate. Well, it's interesting you should say that. And I want to expand on that and add to what Portia said, where it all comes down to like the best, you know, a good candidate. The other big news that broke last night was Donald Trump gave a ringing endorsement to Matthew DiPerno, to be Michigan's attorney general. Now, if you don't know who Matthew DiPerno is, he has been um, probably the biggest, most high profile Michigan lawyer who's been involved in the big lie, you know, the Stop the Steal movement. He's been barnstorming the state, um, speaking to Republican groups, um, you know, any, any place he can get a, a crowd and telling them the election was stolen, we need the forensic audit, blah, blah, blah. And that's the kind, that's music to Donald Trump's ears. You know, unfortunately, though, Donald Trump still holds a great deal of sway in the Republican Party. I don't think Matthew DiPerno is qualified in any way, shape or form to be attorney general of Michigan. But he's got a this was like a rocket boost to his campaign. You know, he he may well end up the not being the nominee. And, you know, I don't make predictions anymore after 2016, but, you know, I think Dana Nessel could handle him pretty handily. Anybody? I mean, other than I'm getting out my checkbook to write checks for Dana Nessel. Um, <laughs> nope, I got nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, listen, you're, you're absolutely right, Nancy. I mean, when Trump endorses any candidate, um, right. it is it is a straight line to the top of, you know, primary across the country. And I think, you know, you can't you cannot negate the power that he still has in the Republican Party. 
you know, there have been one or two Republicans who've tried to try and pull themselves away from Trump and you see what happens to them. So the quite guy, honestly, the guy I don't in know Ohio, what, yeah. Gonzalez, right? Yeah. He, yeah. I can't he decided not to, name. you know, so I, 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 they are over there. I think they're in turmoil for sure. I mean, yeah. you know, I think, you know, we saw Rinky say he wasn't going to the Michigan GOP thing um, that starts, I guess, the end of next week because um, he feels like James Craig is their candidate already or that uh, uh, some of the people working with him are, you know, part of the chair's group. And so that's why he's not going to go. And I think, you know, it's really going to pull them apart if they're not careful, because there are some people who really do not like the direction the Republican Party is going in. Now, that that's a bonus for Democrats. So well, I'm not knocking it at all. Well, it kind of goes <laughs> back to Saeed's point where it's like it's I guess every every cycle we say that the party is in disarray or there's a split or whatever. Dems in disarray. That's kind of like a standing headline. But um, And there's, there's some of that on of our disarray. side too, right? Yes, there is. Yep. Bit, so. All right. Um, let's move on a little bit. Um, Afghanistan. Uh, it's in the rearview mirror, sort of, but Tony Blinken was uh, called on the carpet um, in Congress this week to defend the exit. Uh, Saeed, you are the expert in this area. What was your take on that? Well, first of all, I thought it was interesting that they called out the Secretary of State on the carpet for withdrawal, uh, which is handled by the military. So <laughs> yeah. if they have an issue, they might as well call out the Secretary of Defense. Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, I think that the or the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, but the fact that they uh, maybe for the optics, it would look poorly to go ahead and have a bunch of uh, pasty faced uh, senators uh, beating up on a Secretary of Defense. Uh, doesn't look good for anybody, especially when they're on the uh, payroll of defense contractors. Uh, okay. The other thing, of course, that nobody wants to talk about is that American policy uh, and American law says that you shouldn't be giving uh, material support to a terrorist organization. Uh, but we've actively been negotiating with said terrorist organization in Doha and even currently, which is the Taliban. Uh, I don't know how you reconcile that. I mean, I suppose you could indict and then sue yourself. Uh, but, but these are but these are some important contradictions that then help explain why Afghanistan has been just such a mess. Look, I, again, when we we're talking about debates with uh, Mike Duggan, when we we're talking about uh, uh, James Craig and, and uh, the optics of governor, this all comes down to the optics. Uh, C-SPAN started with a very noble mission to give us an insight as to how our government works, and it has quickly been exploited by those who want to take these snippets and then campaign and fundraise on them. So here's a bunch of senators who are seemingly beating up on Blinken. I'm sure Blinken didn't have any knowledge of the logistics of what it takes to go ahead and have a withdrawal, which are always messy. Uh, this is about as good as it could get. I mean, there's 140,000 uh, people that were evacuated, uh, where the emphasis clearly doesn't seem to be. It's on 13 soldiers who lost their lives. Uh, and uh, what is seen as uh, uh, America essentially scampering away, which is really the only way that it could leave Afghanistan. Listen, we, we should have learned a long time ago uh, uh, during the withdrawal from Vietnam. I was in the Marine Corps with folks that was uh, at the fall of Saigon. Listen, Biden did a, a, a credible job because he was able to take thousands of people with him. In Vietnam, we left so many people there. We left people in Cambodia. We left people in Laos that helped us, and, and they had to pay the price. Uh, they got a lot of people out of Afghanistan. We should have been out of there a long time ago. It, and, and in Vietnam, we left tanks. We left uh, all kind of weapons. We left bases. We left everything. We made Vietnam the strongest country in Southeast Asia. Now, so we, Ford paid the price for that. He didn't get elected. Or, uh, they didn't retain him as president. And that was partly due to the way they left uh, Vietnam. So I think overall, there, is, there was no good way to leave Afghanistan. Trump really threw mud on it, made it even worse. But I'm satisfied. I look at it and say, we got a lot of people out of there. And we and we still negotiating to get folks out of there. The Taliban, uh, the Viet Cong, we are 
listen, we uh, negotiated with every terrorist group in the world at one time or another. So you have to. Excited, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, what do you? How do you see the Taliban actually running the government now out of Kabul? And and how do? You, what role do you see the 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 rebels fighting against the Taliban? How's that all going to play can I, out? Can I add to that too? Just before you answer, sure. Saeed, I, I think that we have this this idea of the Taliban from 9/11 as being like the ultimate the ultimate bad guys, right? You know, they destroyed the Buddhas at uh, Bamiyan and, you know, they're, they're, they're psychotic religious freaks. And yet I, I get the sense that they're trying to maybe clean up their act. I mean, a few people have said this essentially turns Afghanistan over to the influence of China, uh, but China, China likes order. Did you say that on the show once before? China doesn't like disarray. China yeah. doesn't like craziness. Yeah. Um, is the, is t- is this Taliban 2.0? Well, I mean, the question to ask is whether is it Taliban 2.0 or is it the world 2.0? I mean, a lot has oh. changed in 25 years, right? Before, uh, in the 1990s, when the Taliban were in power, there were only three countries that formally recognized it, uh, Pakistan, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia. Now you've got the entire Shanghai Cooperation Organization, um, which includes all the stands, but also China, Russia, India, and maybe Iran as an observer uh, state, they're all trying to figure out what to do with Afghanistan. That's two countries which are UN Security Council permanent members, Russia and China, two superpowers that are in the game. They are going to fill the void and the vacuum with the United States no longer there. As far as the governance uh, thing, I, I'm starting to think that maybe the M uh, for Mullah in the Taliban is being replaced by M in Machiavellian. Uh, they were, they were, and I know it's not a word that we normally would think of the Taliban sitting around <laughs> reading the prints, uh, but here we are talking about people who uh, clearly were able to outflank uh, the uh, delegation in Doha at the end of the Trump administration. Uh, and that the foreign minister of China has been engaged with now for quite some time. Uh, They only do that if they realize that it's not a waste of time and that these are capable uh, diplomats. And that is what the Taliban are definitely showing. Uh, Back to Alan's question about whether there's going to be the internal turmoil. There is. And here there are rumors and rumblings that even within the... uh, Uh, the Taliban regime, you've got uh, this fissure between the Haqqani network and uh, the the, the sort of traditional Taliban. The Taliban are saying, well, we won uh, Afghanistan back from America because of diplomacy. The Haqqani network is saying, well, uh, we won it because of our military prowess. So it's the taste great, less filling argument uh, going on in Afghanistan. But I would submit I would submit to you that when has an incoming administration in the United States Uh, states not had issues. I mean, I recall that uh, when Reagan was shot, uh, Alexander Haig says, I'm in I'm in charge here. And uh, you had a little a little bit of pushback. (laughs) Yeah, a little bit. Just a small bit. (laughs) From from others within the administration. So I I think it would be improper for people to wonder holding on to a scythe that this is the end of the uh, of the Taliban at the same time uh, as as you said Nancy uh, China is going to make sure that the Taliban have enough goods to repel ISIS K and to also try to ensure that uh, Afghanistan is not going to be a haven for terrorists. It's bad for business. It's bad for stability. And the one thing that everyone can agree upon, whether it is uh, the Taliban, the Haqqani Network, or China, no one wants the United States back. No. Yeah. Can I ask you just a quick question? Yeah. I, all, all of a sudden, everybody is referring to ISIS-K. And it's yep. like, is this like a new ISIS? I, I missed the memo on like what, you know, what letter we were on here. What does the K stand for? What is this about? Well, you know, I was going to tell you to sign up for the ISIS newsletter, but that'll just get, a, that'll, that'll, get a, that'll just get another knock on my door like I used to in the past. Uh, ISIS K is ISIS of the Khorasan province, which is actually Afghanistan and that part of uh, the world. Okay. And it's important to realize why there's these different manifestations of ISIS because ISIS is essentially a franchise uh, organization. They have their little groups uh, um, um, and different theaters. Uh, It's decentralized, but everyone then gets to go ahead and um, 
buy from the same supply chain uh, and have uh, in their ideas, you know, a uniform patty and a uniform bun. Uh, <laughs> ISIS is McDonald's. I love it. Right. <laughs> it really is. And I think that this is something that we haven't really understood is that a groups like ISIS are about as neoliberal as you can get. They have followed the corporate model hook, line, and sinker. Oh, God, jeez. So and it's only a matter of time. I, mean, I, know, I know what you're thinking, Nancy. You're wondering what's going to be in the, the toy and the Happy Meal. I, don't know. <laughs> I was saying maybe ISIS can do something about getting the Egg McMuffin all day again. <laughs> that and the ice cream machine working in all locations. Right. That's, yeah, right. that's right. Well, that's Alan, the, the Egg McMuffin will not have any ham in it. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Let's uh, let's skip on to the next topic I, I have here. The um, Bob Ward, once again, the world master of book launches, um, has dropped another bombshell with his latest book on the Trump administration. This concentrating on the election and its aftermath. Um, Alan, do you remember what it's called? What the title is? Um, it was peril. Rage, Fear, Peril. Is that it? Okay, Peril. This is the new one. And um, he's, he's, they've trickled out a number of scoops from it through the week, but the big one that came at the beginning of the week oh was, goodness. of course, about Mark Milley, who, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who apparently was so alarmed by Trump's behavior that he saw in private after the election that he was so unhinged, he was afraid that they were going to, that he was going to touch off a war with China and you know, potentially use that to destabilize the the vote counting and the election certification. Um, and so in his capacity, he supposedly called his Chinese counterpart and um, and warned him of this and told him, don't worry, we got things under control. That is that is a that is a shocking revelation in a, on a lot of fronts, um, but maybe not so much when you think about it. I don't know. The, the right wings uh, or the conservative uh, reaction to this has been he is a traitor. Uh, let's hang him for treason. Uh, the left the lefties are saying, thank God he saved the republic. I mean, what is the you know, what is the story here? What anybody have a good take on this one? I, I, I think that it, I mean, I, th I think obviously because there's a Democrat in office right now, I, I think he's on safe ground. Uh, like you say, I mean, it's so split. I mean, the Republicans. Uh, are, are just so outraged. How could they do that? How could he overstep his constitutional, you know, obligations? He, he should have taken it to Congress. Yeah, because yeah. they, they, uh, they would surely could, handle it. Yeah, <laughs> could there have been a different way? I mean, he was uh, he supposedly talking to Nancy Pelosi about it. I mean, there was concern. I mean, I, I think most of us say, thank goodness there was somebody, there was some uh, check there. Uh, but it's 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 a dangerous you know, it's a dangerous precedent that the military can do that because we've always had, you know, the military answers to the commander in chief and not doesn't override. And when we see that, we see in other governments where the military, where we see it in Myanmar, where, the, you know, we see the, the military is taken over there. Uh, so it, it's a little scary. I think maybe we have to maybe Congress has to set something up to make it a little bit more uh legit than, than what happened. But I think we're all happy that he did it. You know? well, we, we've, we've got precedent, though, Alan. I mean, yeah. remember with Nixon, I mean, when he was looking to put the country on nuclear alert uh -huh. uh, with all of his myriad of issues, including drinking. And I think that the parallels between Nixon and Trump will be a plenty. Yeah. Uh, those are those are those are Venn diagrams that really do overlap quite a bit. By the way, I'm waiting to hear Vanilli's account of this because we've already heard from Millie's. So yeah. there you go. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Vanilli? <laughs> just, just for balance. Um, well, you know, fake band, fake uh, presidency. Uh, but but this idea, I think that uh, that Alan, you're raising about the blurring the line between the civilian and the military uh, we've been lucky so far as a republic, uh, but that was because we had uh, some level of trust in our leadership, the civilian leadership. I think what we've seen now is um, Trump has really exposed the fault lines. Yeah, he's exposed. I think I think we we thought democracy was a lot stronger and he <laughs> showed how weak a foundation our democracy is on where he sort of was able to dismantle the checks and balances in government. And so 
There's a, there's a I, guy who stepped up and provided one of the checks and balances that was badly needed. But it certainly he exposed the government that is not as strong. You know, we're not as strong a democracy as we thought we were. I'm well, one of the uh, uh, most positive things to come out of the Trump is that he did expose some of these right wing uh, generals who, if they had uh, uh, their say, would overthrow the government. And, and and try to run as a hunter or whatever. It, it's unbelievable that we we got we got folks that made it up to four stars, three yeah. stars, talking all this crazy conspiracy stuff. And Trump had them all. You're you talking know, about it, Michael Flynn, of course. Yes, yeah. but yeah. but but there's a lot of military people uh, uh, that was there during the uh, January the sixth. There's a lot of military people that is pushing back on uh, diversity in the military. Uh, you know, if, 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 if they had their way, you get kicked out for being gay, transgender, whatever. You mm -hmm. know, they want to go back the way it was, where they segregated uh, 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 blacks from whites <laughs> and, and used Filipinos as the cooks <laughs> and, and, and the valets in the Navy. So. That you got those folks that's still in in, in the military. Uh, we all, it's we unbelievable. Also, you know the thing that bothers me. To, I'm sorry. We also have to consider what about it going the other way, given the influence of defense contractors in the Pentagon. What about instead of uh, trying to keep the president off the nuclear button, what about goading him to press it? Hmm. Yeah. Well, didn't all of us at the beginning of the Trump administration, when we realized when he was settling in and we realized just what we had done and we saw stuff like him handling some North Korean crisis, a table side at Mar-a-Lago with everyone, you know, with, with the next table, like 10 feet away, you know, listening to everybody talk. Didn't a lot of us kind of think in our, in our hearts, I hope there's somebody in, in the highest command or levels of the military command who can, you know, head this crap off at the, yeah, who's willing to do that. Well, now we found out who it was. It was Millie. Well, well, to me, that moment was when he stared right at an eclipse. Yeah, <laughs> well, I didn't stare at it. He kind of looked up at it, but that's fine. Were you going to say something? No, I was, I mean, you know, I think you're absolutely right. We all had a moment where we thought and hoped and prayed that there was somebody who was rational and had some sense and would hedge what Donald Trump was capable of. The, the, the issue for me is that, you know, we were we were right. There was somebody that did that. And that's great. But the fact of the matter is the reality of it is, is that the country elected somebody who, in my mind, we had all these signs leading up to the election that this was the kind of guy we were getting and that we were going to need to have some sort of savior there to make sure that we didn't end up in perilous times. And so, you know, it. I guess for me, it, it's the question of, did we learn our lesson or are we, you know, marching back to a similar kind of situation again where we're going to need to have somebody who's going to act as a savior? Because I don't know that the country has learned any differently. I don't think we're coming together in any different way that we not we don't end up back at a case where we've elected somebody that we need to have somebody to save us from. There, well, Trump, know? Trump was it, it reminded me with reading about the Depression and when the when the World War One veterans marched on Washington, asking for the money, the bonds, and and Herbert Hoover sent uh, General MacArthur out there with the army, and and they and they beat and 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 did everything to this, the same people they served during the First World War. That was Trump. They just remind me that that we got people like that, and Herbert Hoover was a a smarter. Uh, person, I think, than Trump, but yet he he did not hesitate to use the military to uh, to put his agenda on the table, and, and Trump w was willing to take it uh, farther than that. And you saw what he did when he used the military to uh, walk across the street from the White House to a church. Right. For exactly. yeah. And so, Adolf, I think that's exactly what I'm saying. We've seen this before and now we've seen it and we say like, oh, it can never happen again because Trump was so horrible. And it's like, yeah, no, we did that before. We had horrible presidents who we then elected another horrible president. And so I think, you know, we're not getting any closer to not being in a similar situation again. And at some point we're going to lose out on saviors that are willing to come forward. I, I ran across a line in somewhere and I can't think of who did it in the fire hose of op-eds and you know, hot takes and everything else that I take in in the course of a week where somebody said it turns out that democracy is a lot easier to bring down from the inside 
than mm-hmm. from the outside. And I mm-hmm. think that's absolutely true. Um, I want to make one more point about the, uh, the, the Woodward book before we leave as a former resident of the Hoosier state who spent 20 years of the only life I will have spent living in Indiana. <laughs> I, I have to say I was dumbfounded to hear that Mike Pence, who, you know, apparently was on the fence about perhaps presiding over the certification of the election on January 6th and called Dan Quayle for advice. (laughs) And Dan Quayle was the one who said, you have no options here. You have to do it. Just do it. You, you know, you can't, you can't do what Trump is telling you to do. So as the kids like to say on Twitter, I did not have Dan Quayle saves American democracy on my bingo card this week. <laughs> but apparently that's what happened. I mean, talk about something weird. I mean, but Trump has the one thing Trump has done, he's turned some of these previous statesmen into true statesmen like George Bush looks like. Yes. Oh, oh my God. Amazing yes. statesman, you know, a rational guy. You know, here it is Dan Quayle, who was the biggest lightweight. We've had he could spell potato. Yeah. <laughs> we will never forget. Well, you know, well, the fact that the fact that he made Dan Quayle master ping from <laughs> Kung Fu Panda. I mean, the 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 sage. <laughs> I lived through the Dan Quayle era in uh, in Indiana. It was it was it was interesting. He was from a small town. Um, actually, he's from Arizona, and that's where he lives now. But he apparently spent his high school years. Uh, his his adolescent years in Huntington, which is a little town um, southwest of Fort Wayne, which is where I lived. And Huntington is a very weird place. So I, <laughs> I just I just got to tell you, someday when we're off the air, I'll I'll do this whole stuff. Um, all right, um, I guess we should start thinking about getting to our schmucks of the week, which is our always the capper of this particular show, where we try to call out who was the. Uh, worst person of the previous week. And um, do we have a nominee who wants to go first? I'll go first because mine is really easy. It's off the grid, but it's Nicki Minaj because this week (laughs) she has walked herself into more disasters and more craziness with her story about her cousin's brothers, so-and-so, so-and-so, and and the wedding being called off because of his enlarged or engorged Hold on. Testicles. Why don't we give people <laughs> the backstory? Extremely online and are not on Twitter twenty four hours a day. Uh, a briefing on what happened. Come on, Nikki- if you know, you know. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Nicki Minaj apparently tweeted earlier this week about her cousin in Trinidad's friend. So this is a Trinidadian <laughs> cousin's friend had gotten the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, and his testicles swelled up and he couldn't, uh, he had to call off his wedding. Was that it? Yes. He, yeah, his, he his, the bride his called off the wedding because he was no longer able to do his husbandly duties, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't, so, I don't so know. So she said, everybody just think about this stuff before you, uh, before you get that shot. So yeah, swollen yeah. testicles. But, and which I love the fact that actual <laughs> doctors came back and said that sounds more like chlamydia than the COVID, <laughs> I mean, than the COVID vaccine. So maybe that's why his proposed bride called off the wedding because maybe there was something else going on there. <laughs> then she doubled down, got into like a Twitter war with Joy Reid. Um, she then said yesterday she had been invited to the White House to engage with the president on these issues, to which they immediately responded and said, no, you have not. Uh, we have said we would get you on a call with scientists who can tell you how crazy and wrong you are, but you've not been invited to share your thoughts at the White House. So just again, she's, yeah. she's a, 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 an extraordinary rapper. And I think in this case, I hate to say shut up and dribble, but this is one of those where I'm like, just go back to outlandish music and rapping. Please don't weigh in with your cousin's husband's baby's daddy's father story testicle. about testicle. testicle growth or whatever. So she's my schmuck of the week. Oh, so no okay. no duet with Biden on super bass? No, no. Oh, man. Uh, no, we were looking so forward to it. <laughs> okay. hey, who's, got, who's got next? Um, I'll, I'll go um, next. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll. It's obvious. Uh, Little Caesar. James Craig. Oh, <laughs> I was like, "What did Little Caesar do this week?" <laughs> he can dish it out, but he can't take it. <laughs> and, and if you ever watch the movie with uh, Edward G. Robinson, and at the end he got it, and that's what's going to happen to him when, when he runs for uh, in the Republican primary. If he makes it, 
uh, I, I'll be real surprised. I thought he, I thought he was the clear favorite that he knew what he wanted to do, but it's obviously he he's not ready for prime time. He <laughs> needs to stay in the minor leagues and get some seasoning. Did Did you read uh, Charlie's column about the incident in Deadline this week? Yes. I it, okay, I thought it was pretty good. He pointed out a couple things about that uh, that day, and I know we've already hashed it out, but we need to bring this up again. Uh, he, he referred to his aides as uh, simple-faced white boys who couldn't find Grashin and Shane and gave him $300 for an Uber. Um, one of the guys who was standing next to him, the guy who was holding up the, the clipboard or the folder with the Pistons logo on it, that, I'm told, is Brandon Hall. And Brandon Hall is a, a young man from West Michigan who has already been uh, served time in jail for felony election fraud. I think he did some uh, shenanigans with some petitions. And so it's just kind of interesting that the law and order candidate has an actual <laughs> felon, like, you know, standing on his, on his right shoulder, but you know, there we go. So, okay. Um, my, Alan, who you got? All right. If you hear any noise, they're doing the garbage outside right now. <laughs> that is uh, I, can I pick Bob Enyart. He's a uh, Denver Bible radio dude who uh, was very anti-vaccine, anti-mask, uh, used to play uh, the song Another One Bites the Dust whenever he'd read a uh, obit about somebody who died from AIDS and he died from COVID. Mm. And so, you know, I mean... The guy, you know, people like that are just schmucks. I'm sorry. I mean, here it is. They they try so hard to advocate against vaccines, against masks, and they end up dying. And I don't well, know our, if that's a message to his followers, but. I'm like the emoji. Well, that's all I got. Well. <laughs> now the one bites the dust. Right, exactly. I hope they play that at his funeral. Yeah. Saeed, go, do you have one? Yeah, so mine is uh, Missouri Senator Josh Hawley. Uh, remember him? He flashed the fascist Nazi salute to the insurrectionists. He no, was a, supported was the insurrectionists. Yep. Uh, so he is now against the withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, <laughs> after he was for it under Trump. <laughs> But okay. apparently the way of a senator uh, going ahead and holding your breath until you turn blue, until you get what you want, is that he is holding up uh, some of uh, President Biden's key nominees uh, in both the Department of State and the Department of the Pentagon until, wait for it, uh, Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin resign. Uh, that is not going to happen even um, in a uh, with climate change making the possibility for a cold <laughs> day in hell uh, <laughs> it's still not going to happen. But this, again, is because uh, uh, a different little Caesar, Adolf, uh, has his eyes on the prize for uh, 2024 because he's a Stanford and a Yale Law graduate. So. Nothing screams populism than having an elite uh, pedigree of education. Performative <laughs> populism. So yeah, yeah, yeah. right. So, okay, okay. I guess that leaves it to me. And I had two here. I was going to go with Larry Elder, but I have decided instead, inspired by uh, Portia and um, Alan, to go with Tucker Carlson, who has <laughs> appears on this. You know but apparently has been amplifying Nicki Minaj. And oh, yeah. there is a clip going around, which just cracks me up every time. It's where it's Tucker Carlson with that duh face that he uses, you know, where he looks into the camera and he says, so Nicki Minaj's cousin's friend, if you'd like to talk about this, you know, come on the show. But it, it brings, it related to what Alan was talking about with the guy who died, the, the low level talk show host that died. There is simply no doubt in the mind of anybody with two brain cells to rub together that Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, the whole kind of like, you know, superstar, multi-million dollar paid A-team of right-wing broadcasting are absolutely positively fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. They won't talk about it, but we know they are. In fact, I think they have a uh, mandate at Fox News that they have to be vaccinated. So they're vaccinated, but they're still pushing this bullshit at, <laughs> at, their, at their credulous viewers 
And it's being picked up and amplified by these lower level people who are not making that kind of money, who are serving city or regional markets. And I think we've had now five of these people, talk sh- radio talk show hosts who have died of COVID, all of them kind of little tin pot wannabe Rush Limbaugh's. And, uh, you know, you'd think if you if you just look at the facts on the ground, you would figure out what's going on here. But, you know, it's... And, and Nancy, that, 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 that called... That called- and a Westerner in the uh, UP, uh, thirty years in, who got canned because he wouldn't uh, vax up. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. He was. He, he, was he, he a, belonged to the weather. The weatherman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the was, new he, weather. He the a, weather underground now. They quit because they don't want to get a shot. He did a appearance with James Craig last night. By the way, I saw it on Facebook. Oh my God. Um, Portia, what were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say, and it's that cold day in hell that Saeed spoke about that Tucker Carlson and any of uh, his counterparts from Fox News care about the death of black and brown people. So, I mean, you know, of course, it's no problem for them to tell more people that look like me that they shouldn't get vaccinated because, of course, when I'm in the hospital with a ventilator and, you know, calling my family on a phone to FaceTime them and I'm saying goodbye. Um, Tucker Carlson and the rest of them won't give a shit. So, I mean, if they're, you know, of course they're out there touting that, but I'm sure they're going home not only taking the shot themselves, but making sure all of their wealthy white family members are taking it also. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I think that probably brings us to the end here. And um, I want to thank everybody who showed up to um, do this show without in Craig's absence. Adolf Mongo, our uh resident hysterically funny uh <laughs> democratic <laughs> political consultant thanks for being here portia uh ditto for you from focus hope thank you um and of course saeed always the voice of droll witty um <laughs> refined humor and then i cannot forget my co-host mr Langel over here uh who is also my boss and i kind of big footed you out of the hosting job didn't i i but with the same did the better job than I would have done. The same for me applies to Alan. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, that will do it for the Friday Craig Folly Show, the week that was. And I guess we will be back here next week with Craig in back in the saddle. Um, I will not be here. I'm uh, going on vacation. But um, as for the rest of you, have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you when we come back. And Enjoy, Nancy. Take safe. care, everyone. All right, I forgot. Alan Alan gets the kicker. Oh, safely. Okay, drive home safe. (laughs) The Craig Fawley Show on Deadline Detroit is made possible in part by Lynette's Shrimp House, located in Highland Park. It's Metro Detroit's premier destination, serving juicy fried shrimp, fish, and wings alongside soul food sides and new additions to the menu like turkey tacos and desserts. Located at 13548 Woodward in Highland Park, just north of the Davidson, Lynette's is open for takeaway, noon to 8, Tuesday and Thursday, noon to 10 p.m. Friday and Saturday, and noon to 5 p.m. on Sunday. Call now, get some Lynette's.